So my, my presentation today is really mostly about design PME uh, at CFC, okay? And first, I, I'll start with a disclaimer. Uh, then I will just give you uh, a broad review of my presentation concept with Prizzy. And I'm sure you will fall in love with Prizzy after that. You'll have to order a license. Uh, then I will just summarize our strategic environment narrative that kind of laid the ground for design thinking. Uh, what I mean by the fact that we are in a paradox in PME, and also PME issues that we get out of this paradox and some possible solutions that we're discussing right now at CFC. So first, a disclaimer. I'm not speaking on behalf of CFC, okay? This is going to be mostly my own views about design PME, okay? And sometimes there are some ideas that we have collectively. You will find them with CFC in, in common. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's my idea. So don't go out of here saying, well, CFC is doing that and that's that. And most of it right now, it's brainstorming. Because right now we are in a very interesting junction. We are thinking about our, uh, we don't call it like that, but the second generation of our design education there. And we are also rethinking our, um, let's say, flagship exercise with majors, uh, the one that uh, Ben talked. Um, so that's it. So this is only my own uh, views. One of the main aspects that I think justify uh, design thinking, or let's say more alternative methodologies than simply planning, is that in a world that we see since uh, a 12 decades, that our, our categories, the way we think the world between an external uh, sphere, you know, the international and the internal, the domestic, is collapsing. Okay? And most of our strategic concepts and even our planning construct are not made for this collapse. Um, so one of the good examples that, that you can see there is that, well, you know, we can no longer really recognize who is, who is the police there and who is, you know, the, the, the U.S. Army, you know? uh, Actually, it's just an example of, of how the, the logic of what's going on at the domestic level and international is kind of merged, you know? where you have some operations that really look like policing in Afghanistan and operations that really looks like military conventional operation uh, back home. And actually, if I was an American, that's really my Canadian biased view, I would be more afraid about internal threats than inter external threats. So my projection of this the, uh, strategic environment is that the more time uh, go, the more armed forces are going to be politicized and, and the police is going to be militarized to face uh, challenges. And also the more the um, it's the internal um, uh, security establishment will need support from uh, those who are used to the, the external. Also, this is maybe a cliche, uh, but most of the sectors, we can no longer talk about the military sector, about the social sector, about an infrastructure, or economic, political, and so on and so forth. This is all going to get meshed up, and it's already been meshed up. <coughs> and indeed, Russia already has a concept that, that is really mixing this better than us, actually and the Chinese as well with unrestricted warfare, okay? So our organization are set for a kind of siloed world. But actually the world, if it used to work like that, I'm not so sure, no longer works like that. And it's the same with our concept. If we just stick to one sphere, we will not be you know, relevant. So can we imagine in the future that security organization will no longer be as divided in, in, in branches uh, as we have today. Can we imagine that we will only have one security service that will cover it all? But yeah, this would create other problems. Uh, and also, when shall we stop? You know, should we let the, the military deal with problems that may arise in all spheres? Uh, this brings other uh, questions uh, worth asking. Okay? And what's interesting about SOF is that SOF is maybe the, the embryo of this fusion of security services. Because SOF kind of uh, act in any spheres uh, in the world is, is, is very, um, um, very adaptable. Another aspect of the strategic environment that is really the same messing with our mind is that what well, we used to talk about an enemy and you know allies and friends. And actually, a couple of years ago, I don't remember the, uh, the U.S. commentator. I think it was on, on Fox. He was talking about frenemies and. People were laughing at it. Frenemies, that's so ridiculous. But actually, I think that's the most simple way to say what we want to say here. Is that actually, you can no longer categorize a, a, 
a state as a pure enemy or friend based on just its, its nature. It's really based on the issues that we're talking about. And the more the world is, is going to evolve in this direction, the more you will get strategic ambiguities. So I'm going to give you a very simple example there. I'm Canadian, you're Americans. So right now we are enemies on climate change. But we're allies against Russia and Europe. Canadians are allied with Russia and China on climate change, but we are enemies in Europe. So we're getting in a very complex world like that where you can no longer really, you know, separate things and make it clear. Uh, you really need something, something else uh, to operate in that world. And the last one indeed is that we are, we are used to divide the world between humans and non-humans, between the virtual and the real. Well, right now, you know, you know about technology. We have many movies back in the 80s, Terminator and all that, that we imagine that the machines are going to take over the world. Well, they already did. You know, think about it. You know, just yesterday, I was using my GPS right, to, to move around, and I had only like 10% batteries on it, and I was like freaking out. What happens if, if my, my, my GPS runs down? And I totally forgot you know, my own you know, capability to find my way out, you know, like the good old days just stop at a gas station and ask for where I would go. You know? Because we, are, I'm so, we become so dependent on this technology and we don't realize how this technology is taking decisions for us. Well, the other example is Facebook. Every time you look at Facebook, there's an algorithm that is you know, showing you a specific version of the world that is having an impact of how you see the world in return. So this is going, this is a, a vision that is very uh, messed up and even researchers are saying that all these technologies is kind of recording, re recording our own brain. Like my daughter, the way she, she sees the world will be totally different because we use technologies together and she's going to be better at it and she will think the world differently because of that. So what do we do with this? You know? And the example that I have there, there is uh, enhanced reality for, uh, for fighter pilots where, you know, Maybe 50 percent of, of the decision making will be taken, and perhaps even more, uh, by technology. So, if you think that with this world that I described, this narrative, we can use our old tools from the past that, that were developed during the industrial industrial era, we'd say good luck. But I will remind you as well that this is a narrative. Okay, this is this is our favorite one that is, I think, very popular here, very popular in Canada. And it's also my favorite one, to be honest. You know? um, so if you accept this narrative of fundamental change, of, of, of uh, 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 ever-increasing transformation in the world, of the fact that our concepts are just collapsing, they are no longer relevant to make sense of the world, well, this really means that we need to change our very language to make sense of the world, our concepts, our methods, and our organizations. This leads us to design thinking, which was one of the first way in the military to try to cope with this emerging world. And that's not for nothing that it emerged in Israel, because they look around in their backyard, and most of the transformation I was talking about, they were observing. For instance, the collapse of the internal and the external, when they really saw that the future that they would do would be mostly policing, and that their conventional way of thinking about the military operation would not work. So what is, let's say, the, the key engine of design thinking that allows us to be more agile in this world is simply by going meta, you know? There's no real breakthrough there. Instead of saying, here is the concept, we'll put it in doctrine, and we'll apply it, it's like, no, 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 right now, I'm giving you an engine so that you'll be able to always create new concepts to be relevant with this world. And that was something that was revolutionary uh, back in Israel, uh, and, and back in the day. So that when you would develop your concept, your deliverable, or what have you, your visualization, it would always be tailor-made to a specific time and space. And we would have to make sure that if you want to use it, well, there's, uh, there, the, it won't last forever, you know? So why is there a parallel? Why am I calling there a, a, a parallax there? Okay. <clears throat> what is the psychology all about? When you go see a, a counselor, a psychologist, well, 
if I go to re the really stereotypical way of seeing psychology, is that, well, you want somebody who will bring, bring you uh, awareness to your subconscious, to things that you may have forgotten that really have an impact in your way of, of behaving. That if the, the, the psychologist is able to do that, then you will get a better grasp on your life because you are aware of things or traumas that used to, that would have an impact on you. So then you can do a, a treatment or work uh, on this. So psychology is about bring awareness to your subconscious, right? If we go to sociology, which is more what I do, it's basically the same. It's to bring awareness to social conventions that we have so that we can be more free with them. Okay? And one of them, for instance, social mobility. Well, I don't know anything about social mobility. I need a researcher who will do the work and tell me that, for instance, we have greater social mobility in Canada than in the US, which means that somebody who is uh, born poor can have greater chance of becoming richer uh, later. But without sociology, without this research, well, I, I could have thought intuitively um, this, but I would not have the, the concept to really do something about it, and, and the government would not have nothing to do something about it. So what's the point of sociology? Is to bring awareness to social conventions that we take for granted. Well, what's the point of design thinking? I know that we have many definitions. Uh, one of them is, is very similar. is to bring awareness to the assumptions that we take for granted, the assumptions that may come from you know, a, an older era, from, from the course that you've taken five years ago, or what have you, to really disrupt these assumptions, to open a space for creativity to be more relevant to your era. So this leads us to the paradox. Is that what I see from my perspective, and you may be against me, is that most defense organizations in the world they are aware of that. They are aware of a world that is changing. They buy this narrative. But they find it too costly to do really something about it. Academics like me, that's what we want. We want to make you realize that these concepts may make you do things that you may not have thought about, you know, without you being conscious. But what happens if I tell you and you're like, so what? I'm just going to continue what I'm used to. We reach a paradox. There's nothing I can do for you. <coughs> That's exactly what my uh, Armed Forces major told me. He was the syndicate leader of the group, and I had uh, you know, trouble with this group. It was a very uh, difficult group. And he told me, Philip, I'm totally aware of what you're trying to do with this, I think. And I think that's the way to go. But look at us. We're just, we only have 10 years you know, in front of us. We're too old. It's, it's not going to work. You, know, you cannot change us. You cannot change our way of thinking. Okay. And I appreciate you for what you want to do, but that's it. And that's basically at the individual level. That many people repress their inner designer, because we're all designers, when you think about it. If I ask you to refurbish your kitchen, what, what will you do? Will you start planning? No, you'll have a discussion with your wife or with your kid, and you will visualize what it could be. You know, we all have an inner designer inside us but it has been repressed, or we, we are repressing it. it. Especially if we don't have any incentives to let it you know, express itself. <laughs> so, and the other uh, aspect is that most of our students come from engineering, so they really have a, a, a scientific way of, of seeing war. And what I try to tell them is that maybe it's not the only way to see war, and war it's one of the most, let's say, uh, disruptive phenomena and that even if you find some scientific laws about it, it's going to be uh, disrupted. But all this make that, you know, repressing the unfamiliar, what may come out of, of design thinking, uh, will probably be what's going to happen. One of the examples is in Ben's group. Uh, ben was only there during the first week, and his group had the most innovative approaches to deal with West Africa. And they just freaked out, because it was so unfamiliar, they were like, I'm not sure I want, I want to present this. But they finally did. It was praised by some of, some of us. But their way of thinking about the military was so sedimented that they were still unsatisfied, although they were the best group. 
anything about it. So <clears throat> one other problem that, that I witness uh, myself is that, well, it's, it's, it's really difficult, if not impossible, for students to think about another way to validate knowledge, to make sure that they know that they know. And the way I put this, this picture is that <clears throat> back in the Roman Empire, there was an emperor called Septimus Severus. And he, he asked for a dome to be constructed in his, in his honor. And on this dome, there would be the constellation of his date of birth. So every time he would look at it, it's as if you know, the world elected him as a leader. And that's not only it. He would hire astrologists that would just confirm to him all the time that that's the world that he thought he was looking at was exactly this world. The way I'm telling this is that, well, you work for sovereign power. And if you bring SMEs in your shop, well, you can be almost sure that they will act as these astrologists. That they will just give you exactly what you want to hear. Okay? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to get there. Um, <clears throat> So, and, and the students, because they are so used to an objective way of, of looking at the world, that they just want to try to find a way uh, uh, to validate their knowledge with, with the picture that they see as a team, well, they will use the SME as what I call a tribunal of reason, although the, the original SME has a very limited knowledge of a region, okay? So they, would, they basically take the SMEs, like I said, as astrologists bringing uh, as external manifestation of truth of the world. And indeed, the SMEs are paid to do that, so, so they, will, they will do the job. So, what should we do with this? Um, <clears throat> well, because I was talking about SME, I'm just going to go there. Uh, there I'm following the, is the Israelis that bringing SMEs during design activities is really not the best way to proceed. And that one of the best way to proceed would be to ask them to provide primary sources that are not really accessible. So sources that really disrupt our way of thinking about a different society uh, <clears throat> and, and other stuff like that, and that students should not have direct access uh, to them. They should do their own work by reading these primary sources and try to analyze them. And the other thing that we are doing uh, uh, there is that instead of saying, well, we have design in a totally different way of, of thinking, <coughs> we are making design way more uh, implicit in the last course that they are having. So we are really focused on the course environment instead of the course content. So we, are, we select, and we talked about it during the break, we will select messy issues that force students to rethink really with something else than what their, their favorite tools, basically. And one of the insurance policies that we're thinking is that <laughs> if we remove uh, directly design theory and so on and so forth, we will organize reflection sessions so that instructors will have the mandate to ask design-like questions or reflective questions uh, to really kind of uh, inside students to use their innate designer. Great. And if we talk about the, uh, <clears throat> or about what is relevant in the world to include in, in your frame, your design, which is ontology, um, it's 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 funny because when you when you look at uh, you know private firms offering design, it's always really trendy, and they're like. This is a, a, a Danish uh, design firm called Is It a Bird? Like, are you ready to question everything? And these students are like, yes, we're ready to question everything. But actually, they don't have the means to question everything. And one of the problems is that, well, we don't, the, well, one of the aspects that would be very exposed is to have a greater diversity of thoughts. But because we have students uh, <clears throat> that, are, that, that have been grown up in the military, it's very difficult to have. And even if you say, well, okay, we'll have, uh, we'll put, let's say, uh, the same ratio of, of women per, per course, the same ratio of, of uh, Navy, um, Air, <coughs> Army, uh, intelligence, and so on and so forth, well, diversity of thought is really limited. So perhaps it's visible because it's not the same uniform, it's not the same gender, but usually, you know, the, uh, the way to see the world, it's, it's stretched, but really didn't. In my research, one of, uh, and I know that some, I interviewed some of you, one of the questions that I ask everybody in Israel, in the US, and Canada about design 
what is this question? You know, are there sacred cows that you cannot question with design thinking? So I would say that most in the US and Canada would be able to question the hierarchy with design, uh, organizational products, uh, but they would never really question assumptions about uh, themselves, their country, their culture, uh, or others. It's very difficult to get outside their bias about uh, other countries like Russia, for instance. Uh, in the IDF, if you look at, at Shimon Nave and his, and, his, uh, and his team and his disciples, that's, I couldn't never you know, imagine this, but the only thing that they will not question is their professional vocation, military excellence. But after that, they can even question Israel and its territory. It's like, yeah, we can, we can, we can think about it. We don't necessarily need to have the West Bank and, and, and keep our soldiers there. Um, but this is really the, the extreme case of where design can lead you. It doesn't mean that you need to change everything. But if you're really you know, open to question everything, well, ideally you should go up to there, not just stick to there. And yeah, one, one of the examples that I can give you <clears throat> that we don't really question our reality is when you have students saying, well, uh, <laughs> that, well, you know, we, we did our exercise in West Africa, and, you know, these two are doing tourist action. Well, it's because they need jobs. So we'll send some sweatshops over there, and they will work there, and we'll, we'll resolve part, part of the problem. Well, I cannot imagine two are going into these shops, first of all. Um, and, and my point there is that we need to be aware that even if we use design and we say we, we are able to question everything, we have been born in a, in a liberal world, you know, with, with liberal values, uh, with democracy, uh, individual right, and so on and so forth. And it's difficult to understand the world differently. We will tend to project this on uh, others. And especially I would say with bus business design tools, because business design tools are made to create products, products in liberal societies. Not in societies that you will mostly engage as a soft operator. And most people doing business design who are using it with the military, they don't adapt to their methodology. So most of the time you're stuck with implicit liberal design. So possible way, ways up. Well, <clears throat> I would really stress the fact that anybody who comes from the business world need to adapt its model, especially for the military, because it's, it's different. I mean, you're not creating a new iPod there. Uh, the other one, and we, we follow Ben on this, especially myself, and I will propose to uh, the general I'm working with that we should focus on discovery learning. So instead of going with, with the theory, now that <coughs> is to give activities to uh, students so that they will open up uh, what they see in the world by themselves. So I think we need to find ways to make them more autonomous. <coughs> One way, and we already talked about it, and that we are thinking about it, uh, is to try to bring some facilitation skills. And this is really useful beyond just facilitation, because when you facilitate, you develop a different ways of listening to other people and try to uh, help them develop new ideas and reach patterns. <clears throat> the other one that we, uh, one of the professors developed, and I really like the analogy, is the, the authentic <coughs> value, is that, well, the more, colon especially colonels, uh, go into the program, uh, the more we need to give them autonomy uh, to educate themselves. So in the end, if they are able to educate themselves, because let's be honest, after the colonel course, they will not go back uh, you know, in any educational institutions. So, so they will no longer need an instructor. So now, how can we do that concretely? Uh, I will not get into content, but there are many ways that we can uh, and the last one, the dream that I would say Paul, myself, and, and one of our uh, facilitators have, uh, would be to, to, to have a design studio uh, for uh, colonels that would be there for the whole year or syndicate, where they would not only uh, develop a, a strategy uh, or any kind of design product, but also design their own uh, design model, so to speak. So if they could achieve that with minimal super supervision, well, you know, they become independent designers. <coughs> Great. So that was it. My uh, big model, linking uh, strategic environment narrative, is laying the ground for design thinking.
the parallax that we observe that most defense organizations and even ourselves tend to repress our inner designer and some of the ways uh, that may be tried were not done uh, yet to try to get out of the parallax. So some of the takeaways um, is that without this, this strategic narrative of transformation, there's no point of doing design. So <coughs> design thinking and all these approach are vulnerable unless you think that our way of seeing the world is going to continue uh, in this way. The second point is that we cannot really resolve the problem. We cannot force students who repress their inner designer, but there are ways we can bypass it. And in any way, my bet is that with time, this problem is going to, to solve. And also, what, is, what, 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 what can we project as a CFC second generation design is that we will way more focus on the environment of the uh, education instead of really focusing on the content so that the, uh, like I said, the inner designers and the student can, can better speak and, and that they, they can also become more autonomous. <clears throat> so this is the end of my, uh, my presentation. I would like to thank Ben and you again for inviting me here because I think that the, the strength uh, of the design movement is really in its, in its network. Uh, thanks to these back and forth trips, we exchange ideas, uh, we test them, we experiment. Uh, and we become uh, better.